Welcome to Shauna May, Book of Kings. Today, we continue with the tale of the occlutation of K. Kosrov. The courtiers listened to him in bewilderment, and sorrow filled their hearts. But Zal was angered and heaved a cold sigh. He said to the assembled Persians, This is not right. Wisdom has no place in his mind. I have never seen a king who talked in this way, and since he has spoken his mind, so must we. When he says such things as, we are under no obligation to agree with him, it is as if a demon has been advising him. He's abandoned the path of God. Feridun and the God-fearing who sung never grasped at such straws. I shall tell him the truth, even if it means I shall suffer for it. The Persians answered him, no, Kyanid has ever talked like this. We are all behind you on what you tell the king. Zal stood and addressed K. Kosrov. Just king, listen to the words of an old and experienced man. And if my advice seems crooked to you, make me no answer. Speech in support of what is right is bitter, and this bitterness closes the door against injury and loss. You should not be offended by the true words that I say here in this company. Your mother bore you in Tehran, and you grew up there. You're the grandson on one side of Afrazab, who practiced black magic even in his sleep. Your other grandfather was the malevolent King Kavas, whose dissembling face hid a heart filled with trickery and cunning. He ruled from the east to the west, but he wanted to fly up to the heavens and count the stars there. I advised him at length not to try this, and my words were bitter. He heard my advice, but it did him no good, and I left him with a heart full of sorrow and pain. He rose into the air and tumbled to the earth. God granted him his life, but he felt no gratitude. His head was filled with dust, his mind with terror. You led a hundred thousand armed warriors to battle on the Corosium plain, and before the armies all fought on foot with Pasheng. If you had conquered you, Iran would have been open to Afrasab's forces, but God delivered him into your hands. You were able to kill whoever men feared, whoever gave no thought to God's law. I told you to cease your wars then, that the time for forgiveness and rejoicing had arrived. But now, worse times than ever have come to Iran, and men's hearts are filled with a more terrible fear. You've abandoned God's ways and strayed into an evil path. You'll get no profit from this, and it will not please God. My king, if this is what you want, no one will support you. You'll regret these words. Think of what you're doing and don't follow demon's orders. If you persist in this devilish plan, God will cut you off from his far. You will live a life of pain and sin, and no one will call you king again. If you ignore my advice, you are following Armon. Pain will be yours, and you will lose good fortune and homage due to a king and the throne itself. May wisdom guide your soul. May your mind remain pure and steadfast. Zal fell silent, and the whole company spoke in his support, saying, We agree with all this old man has said. The doorway to truth should not be concealed. When Kostro had heard them out, he said nothing for a while, and remained lost in thought. Then he spoke quietly, weighing his words. You have seen the world's ways, Zal, and you have lived long years chivalrously and well. I spoke coldly to you uh, be here before this assembly. God would not approve of such an evil act. Also, Rostam would be upset when he is upset Iran suffers. His efforts on Iran's behalf far outweigh the wealth he has received as a reward. The heavens made him my shield, the scourge of evil doers, leaving them time for neither sleep nor food. I shall answer you mildly. My words won't break your heart. Then in a voice that all could hear, he said, My victorious lords, I have heard everything that Zal has said before this assembly. I swear by God himself that I am far from obeying demons. It is to God that my soul inclines, for I see him as the cure to my suffering. In clarity of heart I have looked on the world, and wisdom has become my armor against evil. Turning to Zal, he said, There is no need for such anger. Speak as is fitting. First, you said no wise or precipitous 
person was ever born of Turanian stock. I am the son of the great Siavash, the Sion of an invincible Kyanid king, the grandson of Kavas, who was a wise, fortunate, and well-loved monarch. On my mother's side, I am descended from Ophersop, whose hatred deprived me of rest and food. His forebear was Faradon, and there is no shame in such an ancestry. The Irans, lying like warriors, fled to the sea in terror before Ophersop. Then you said that Kavas built himself a flying chariot and tried to go beyond what is fitting for a king. But you should know what ambition is not fault in a king. Next, I sought revenge for my father's death and won victory in all the world. I killed my enemies, who had spread injustice throughout the land. My task in the world is complete. No trace remains of the evil doers against whom I fought. Whenever I think deeply about prosperity and enduring royal power, I see the examples of Kavas and Jamshed before me. I fear that I'll forget my status as they did, that I'll become corrupt like Zahok and Tor, whose evil sickened the world. I fear that when the thread of my days draws to an end, I, like them, shall be headed for hell. For these five weeks, in which I have prayed day and night, know that the great God has freed me from the sorrows of this dark earth. I am sated with my army, the crown, the throne. I am unencumbered. And I am now ready to depart. You, Zal, with all the experience of your advanced age, say that I have fallen into a demon's trap, that I am wandering far from the right road in darkness and sin. But I cannot see how I have done evil. Or where you can find God's punishment in all this. When Zal heard these words, he turned aside in shame. A cry came from his lips, and he addressed Kosrov. Great king, my words were hasty and unwise. Wisdom is yours, and I apologize. If demons have deluded anyone, I am that person. Forgive what I have done. I've lived for countless years, and always shown unswerving loyalty to Persia's throne. Till now I've never seen a Marnock pray for heaven's holy guidance in this way. But K. Kosrov is now my sapient guide, and may I stay forever at his side. Throughout Iran all virtuous men will grieve to learn the king we've served now longs to leave. How can we hope for this? But what he chooses, no loyal subject, can the king refuse. When Kosrov heard Zal's words, he accepted his apology, knowing that all he said came only for his love of him. He took Zal by the hand and sat him next to him on the throne. Then he said, Go now with Rostam, Tas, Gudaz, Give, and the rest of our nobility, and pitch tents and pavilions on the plain outside the city. Display our banners, assemble our troops and elephants there, as if for a splendid celebration. Rostam did as the king ordered. The nobles brought tents and pavilions out of storage and filled the valley from mountainside to mountainside with white, black, purple, and blue tents, flags of red, yellow, and purple fluttered here, and in the midst of all stood the Caravani banner. Zell's tent, with its black flag, was pitched next to the king's, and on its left was Rostam's tent, where the dignitaries he had brought from Kabul were gathered. In the foreground were the tents of Tus, Gudus, Giv, Gorgian, Kerod, and Sapur. Immediately behind them was Bazan and Gastaham, and the other important chieftains. The king sat on his golden throne and took the ox-headed mace in his hand. On one side, like a great monarch and a savage lion, were Zal and Rostam. On the other hand, Tuz, Gudus, Giv, Roham, Shapur, and Gorgian all stared at the king, waiting to hear what he would say. He addressed them in a loud voice. My champions, favored by fortune, each of you with sense and wisdom knows that both good and evil pass away. We too, and the world itself, are ephemeral. Why then do we suffer such pain and sorrow and grief? We build our lands with our hands, and what we build we leave to our enemies, while we ourselves must depart. But the ox of our sorrows is still not skinned, since rewards and punishments are with God. Fear God, then, and do not rejoice in this dark earth, for this day passes from everyone, and time counts every breath we breathe. From Hoshang to Kavas, there have been kings possessed afar. 
the crown and the throne, nothing remains of them but their names. No one can compute the numbers of those who have gone before us. Many turned against God, and in their days they feared the evil they had done. I am a slave like them. And though I have striven and suffered, I see that no one remains on this earth. Now that I have torn my heart and soul from this fleeting world, I have brought my grief and pain to an end. I have gained all I sought, and I turned my face aside from the royal throne. I give to anyone I have offended whatever wealth he desires. I shall tell God, who knows all that is good, of the actions of these heroes who have helped me. I donate my possessions, my weapons, my treasuries to the nobility of Iran. I have listed and handed over my cash and slaves and flocks, for I am setting out on a journey, and have separated my heart from this earthly darkness. Rejoice now for a week. Give yourself to pleasure and food and drink. Wish me well. Pray for my safe passage from this world, and that I may depart without suffering. When the king finished speaking, the heroes of Iran were bewildered and uncertain what to make of his words. One said, The king is mad. Wisdom and his heart are utter strangers to one another. Who knows what will become of him, or of the crown and the throne? The plain and the mountain slopes were filled with warriors. They formed groups and began to feast. The valley re-echoed with the sounds of flutes and singing and drunken shouts. The revels went on for a week, and no one gave a thought to pain or sorrow. On the eighth day, Kay Kosrow sat on his throne, but he wore neither the royal crown nor torque, and the royal mace was nowhere in evidence. Since he felt that the time for his departure was at hand, he opened one of his treasuries and said to Gudas, "'Consider how the world passes, and take note of what is hidden as well as what is plain. There is a day for amassing treasure, and a day for distributing it. Look at our ruined frontier forts and bridges at our crumbling reservoirs, destroyed by Afrasab. Look at our motherless children, at our widowed wives who sit alone and desolate, at our indigenous people at who harbor secret sorrows. Don't hold back the contents of our treasuries from those in need. Distribute wealth to them in fear of future bad fortune. And I have a treasury called Badavar which is filled with jewels and diadems. Use this for our ruined cities that have become lairs for leopards and tigers, for our smashed fire temples left without officiating priests, for those who are old and poor because they gave away their wealth when they were young, for our dried-up wells left waterless for years. And in the city of Sush, there is another treasury built up by my grandfather. Its name is Alms. Give its contents to Zal, Jiv, and Rostam. He then consigned the contents of his wardrobe to Rostam, together with his torques, royal jewels, jewels, corslets, and heavy maces. His flock of horses he gave to Tus, his orchards and gardens to Gudaz, tired now of war. He gave his armor in which he had endured so much to brave Jiv. To Farabors, Kavas' son, he gave his castles, tents, pavilions, and stables, as well as his helmet and diadem. He gave to Bizan a torque brighter than the planet Jupiter, and two famous rings set with rubies, with his name engraved on them, saying as he did so, Take these in memory of me, and see that you sow only seeds of righteousness and seeds of righteousness in this world. The king said, My life draws to an end, and I long for another dispensation. Ask from me what you will. The time has come for this assembly to disperse. All the nobles wept at the prospect of losing their sovereign lord and said, Who will inherit the king's crown? Zal, who had always been loyal to the Persian throne, kissed the ground and stood to speak. Lord of the world, it is right that I express my desires openly. You know what Rostam has done for Iran, the pains he has taken, the labors he has undergone, the battles he has fought. When Kavas went to the distance, Mazandran, and was captured by demons along with Gudaz and Tus, Rostam was there alone on a journey that pitted him against deserts, darkness, demons, a lion, a dragon, and a sorceress. He won through to the king in Mazandran. He cut the white demon in pieces. 
He did the same to other demons there too, and he severed the head of Sanji, whose screams re-echoed to the heavens. Because of Kavas's enmity, he killed his son, Sorab, whose like the world has never seen, and wept for him for months and years. If I were to describe all the tales of his prowess, I would never finish. If the king is tired of his crown and throne, what will he leave to this loyal, lion-hearted warrior? Kostro replied, Who but God himself, the Lord of justice and love, can know all that Rostam has done on my behalf? The struggles he has undertaken, the sorrows he has suffered, his valor is no secret, and no one has seen his equal in all the world. He ordered that a scribe bring paper, musk, and ambergris, and a document was written by Kostro's command, conferring on Rostam the mammoth body warrior, who was praised by all men the lordship of Sistan. The document was affixed with the royal seal, and Kostro handed it to Rostam, saying, May this land remain forever under Rostam's sovereignty. He then gave robes, gold, silver, and goblet filled with jewels to the astrologers, who had come to the court with Zal. Then Gudars rose, and he addressed the king. Victorious king, I have seen no occupant of the throne equal to you. From the time to Manachar to that of Kay Kobad, and throughout noble Kavas reign, I stood ready and vigilant in our king's service. I had seventy-eight sons and grandsons. Eight are left to me, and the others have perished. My son Jiv lived as a fugitive in Tehran for seven years. Wild asses were his food, and he clothed himself in their skins. When the king reached Iran, he saw all that Jiv had endured on his behalf, and now that the lord of all the world is tired of the throne and crown, Jiv hopes for a reward for his labors. The king replied, He did far more than this, and may he be blessed a thousand times. May God protect him, and may his enemies' hearts be lacerated with thorns. All I have is yours. I pray that you survive in health and glory. He ordered that a charter be written on silk, conferring sovereignty of Quam and Esfon, the cradle of champions, on Gudas, a gold seal was attached to it, and Kosro pronounced his benediction, saying, May God be pleased with Gudas, and may his enemies' hearts be filled with confusion. To the Persian nobility, he said, My hope is that Jiv will never tire of his noble deeds. Know that he will be remembrance of me in the world, the defender whom I leave to you. Obey him, and do not slight either his or his father's commands. When Gudaz had taken his seat again, Tus rose and kissed the ground before Kostrov. He said, Long live the king, and may evil never touch him. I alone of those here all descended from Faradun, and I headed this clan until K. Kobad came. I have led the Persians in battle, and have never relaxed my vigilance, not for a single day, in the mountainside of Hamavan. I endured the wounds my armor inflicted on my shirtless body in the battle of revenge for Siavash. I kept watch every night when Kavas was imprisoned in Mazandaran. Tus was imprisoned with me. I have never deserted our troops, and no one has ever complained of my conduct. Now that the king, who knows all abilities and faults, has grown tired of his crown and throne, and prepares to leave the fleeting world, what orders does he give me? What authority does he leave me? Kostrov replied, You have striven and suffered beyond measure. Be lord of the Kavani banner, commander of my armies, and the sovereign of Kosaron. This, too, was recorded before the nobles, written on a royal charter, and sealed with gold. When the king had dealt with his nobles' affairs, he sank back exhausted and weak. One who had not been mentioned yet as a beneficiary of the king's bequest was Lorosp, and Castro ordered Bizen to bring his chieftain before him. As he entered, the king rose and opened his arms in welcome. Descending from the throne, he lifted the crown from his own head and gave it to Lorasp, saying, I bestow on you sovereignty over the land of Iran. May this crown that is new to you bring you good fortune, and may all the world be your slave. I hand over to you here the sovereignty and treasure which I have built up with such struggle and pain. Henceforth, see that only justice issues from your mouth, since it is justice that will bring you victory and prosperity. If you would have your luck remain ever young, 
and flesh allow no demons access to your soul. Be wise, harm no one, and always guard your tongue. Then he turned to the Persians assembled there and said, Rejoice in his throne and good fortune. The Persians were astonished by this turn of events and bridled their angry lions. None could accept that they would have to call Lorosp their king. Zal strode forward and said aloud what he felt in his heart. My lord, it is right for you to dignify such dirt in this way. My curse is on anyone who calls Lorasp his king. No one here will submit to such injustice. I saw Lorash when he arrived in Aran. He was a wretch with one horse to his name. You sent him off to fight against the Alans and gave him soldiers, a banner, a sword belt. How many well-born Persians has the king passed over for this man, whose family I've never set eyes on, whose ancestry is all unknown? No one has ever heard of such a man becoming king. As soon as Zal finished speaking, a roar of agreement came from the courtiers there, and the voices cried out, We'll serve no longer if Lorasp is to be king. He can count on us for neither his banquets nor his battles. When Khosro heard Zal's words, he said to them, Not so fast, and calm your rage. A man who speaks unjustly is more interested in smoke than fire. God does not approve of our doing evil, and the wicked will tremble before the revolution of fate. When God makes a man fortunate, deserving of sovereignty, an ornament to the throne, that man has wisdom then, as well as far dignity and royal ancestry. He will be just and victorious, and his justice will bring him his prosperity. As God is my witness, Lorosp is possessed of these qualities." He is descended from the pure soul Hashan, who was the lord of all the world. He will cleanse the earth of evil magicians, and establish the ways of God. The world will be renewed through his guidance, and his son will continue his legacy. Greet him as your king, and as you love me, do not turn aside from my advice. Any man who ignores my words has destroyed whatever credit he may have built up fighting for me, and he is ungrateful before God and his soul will be assailed from every side in, by terror. When Zal had heard him out, he touched the earth with his fingers and smeared black dirt on his lips. Loudly he greeted Lorasp as king, and he said to Khosro, Live in happiness, my lord, and may evil never touch you. Who but the king of victory and justice could have known that Lorasp was of a royal descent? I have sworn repentance for what I have said, blanking my lips with dirt, made my sin be cancelled. The chieftains scattered jewels over La Rasp, hailing him as king. And now I finish my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Till then, my friends. <laughs>